Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to talk about worship and sacrifice in our continuing study of Old Testament theology. In his commentary on Leviticus and Numbers, Bellinger says Leviticus does not articulate a theory of sacrifice, but simply describes a variety of sacrifices. That actually begins from the very first verse, where instead of telling us why we are sacrificing, um, the author just assumes that we know why. It jumps immediately into the way those sacrifices are to be performed. What takes place, though, in a sacrifice? First of all, there's the principle of a gift. It's a, a sacrifice is a gift that is being given to God. Secondly, there's a principle of death that takes place. Now, that's not true of every sacrifice, but when I say a sacrifice, uh, especially if it's an animal sacrifice, that is uh, involved involving the death of the animal. Uh, the animal serves as a substitute where the animal is dying instead of me. It's dying in my place. And finally, we have the principle of a healed relationship. One of the reasons, not the only reason a sacrifice is given, but there are times when a sacrifice is given because I have done something to break the relationship between myself and God, and now the sacrifice is given in order to heal that broken relationship. Leviticus chapters 1 through 7 are the chapters that deal with the sacrifices. Chapters 1 through 5 give a uh, a number of types of offerings. There are five of them. The burnt offering, the grain offering, the peace offering, the sin and guilt offerings. The first three of those in verse in chapters one through through three, and, and notice uh, there's five chapters here, five offerings. So there's, there's uh, a chapter for each offering. Um, the first of three are offered in worship, but then the last two, the sin and the guilt offerings, are offered because there is some sort of sin, there's some sort of guilt, there is some sort of broken relationship, like we just spoke of. And then in chapters 6 and 7, uh, we we transition from the sacrifices to the priest's actions in the offering of those rituals, and it makes mention of the disposal of the offering after it's been offered, um, j- just all the details that are the priestly functions in those chapters 6 and 7. Now, why are there five different sacrifices if they all represent Jesus? And let me just say, they do represent Jesus. But why why five different offerings? Why not just one? And I think the reason is because when we look at at the various sacrifices, um, it's like looking at the different facets of a diamond. Uh, The the death of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus, was multifaceted. And so, in these five sacrifices, we see different aspects of our relationship with God and of what Jesus did on our behalf. We begin then with the burnt offerings. Uh, This didn't originate here in Leviticus. You actually have the idea of a burnt offering all the way back in Genesis chapter 8, where Noah comes off the ark. Remember, he had taken with him uh, two of every kind of animal, but then he had taken seven of the clean animals, those animals that were appropriate for sacrifices, which meant that the idea of a sacrifice and the idea of a burnt offering were already there. The term is used there back in Genesis chapter 8. You also have the idea of Abraham, when, remember when he's told to take Isaac and to offer up Isaac as as a offering. Isaac was to be a burnt offering, uh, offered up to the Lord. And of course, God stopped Abraham from doing that uh, before he killed the son. Uh, Abraham uh, was, was told to stop, and he lifted up his eyes, and he saw a ram caught in a thicket, and he sacrificed the ram in its place. But still, there was this idea of a burnt offering. The worship of the golden calf. Now, that wasn't wasn't a good thing. That was a bad thing. But that involved burnt offerings and peace offerings. It's described that way in Exodus chapter 32 and verse 6. Um, And so the idea of a burnt offering was already there. Uh, It was not first introduced in the book of Leviticus. Secondly, this was the basic offering. Um, it, uh, it's the offering that you see every morning and every evening uh, that would begin the day of worship, that would end the day of worship, uh, and the offering would be given uh, twice a day. These offerings were also held at various feast days. So this is going to be an all-around general offering. 
it was to be completely consumed by fire. That is why it's referred to in our English language as a burnt offering. Um, various types of, of animals are allowed. You could have a, a bull, a sheep, or a goat, birds, um, and which animal you used depended would be dependent upon uh, how well off you are. A, a, a wealthier person is expected to give a wealthier offering because um, because that's what he has. A poor person doesn't have a bull or a sheep or a goat because he's so poor. Yeah, but but he can he can at least afford maybe a bird. And so uh, notice the offerings are tailored to their financial means. Leviticus 1 verse 3 explains this. If his offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he shall offer it as a male. Without defect, he shall offer it at the doorway of the tent of meeting. That is, uh, as you as you first went into the general area of the tabernacle. Uh, he may be accepted that in order that he may be accepted before the Lord. Now, the term offering there, if his offering, uh, the Hebrew word there, karban, uh, in fact, uh, we have the word karav, to come near, and that's the idea. This is an offering that allows him to come near. Uh, and notice, if his, if, an off, if his offering is a burnt offering, now that term burnt offering, the Hebrew word there is just uh, olah, just means to go up, uh, uh, Allah is to ascend. So it's an offering that sort of, I, I always think of it as an offering that goes up in smoke. In other words, it, it burns and, and, and the smoke rises. Um, don't read more into it than that. It, that's just the basic term uh, for the offering, for a burnt offering. Uh, but a uh, going up op- offering, and like I said, uh, uh, just an easy way to remember it is that it goes up in smoke. Verse 4, he shall lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering, that it may be accepted for him to make atonement on his behalf. Now we're going to see this in a number of offerings, where where someone lays his hand upon the offering to identify himself with the offering. Verse 5, he shall slay the young bull before the Lord, and Aaron's sons, the priests, shall offer up the blood and sprinkle the blood around on the altar that is in the doorway of the tent of meeting. That This is the, the brazen altar, the altar that's out in front of the tabernacle. Ephesians chapter 5 alludes to the same thing in verse 1 where, where Paul says, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Now we're going to see some other things with aromas that are inside the tabernacle, but when Jesus is described as an offering, a, a burnt offering, in other words, he was lifted up. <laughs> Remember, it's a, it's, a, it's a going up offering. He was lifted up on a cross. And notice, as a fragrant aroma, I don't want to read that too literally, but I can't help but think of that instance where on the week before Jesus was crucified, where a woman came in and anointed him with a fragrant perfume. And we're told there in John chapter 12 that the aroma filled the entire house. And I like to think uh, that it remained all throughout the week, even there upon a cross. So, so like I said, we, we shouldn't take it too literally, but really, literally, as Jesus was upon the cross, he was very literally, but also spiritually, a, a fragrant aroma uh, to God. Now, the burnt offerings, uh, in chapter 1, verse 1, we see that when any man brings an offering, and then we have the instructions, uh, whether it's a bull from the herd, a sheep or goat from the flock, or a, a bird, uh, it could be a turtle dove or a young pigeon. Uh, so these various offerings each has their own set of instructions. The bird offering was the foundational offering that allowed men to come into the presence of the Lord. Leviticus chapter 1, verse 3, he shall offer it at the doorway of the tent of meeting, that he may be accepted before the Lord. Verse 4 goes on to say, he shall lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering, that it may be accepted for him to make atonement on his behalf. It's a very personal thing. And he gets personally involved in touching, in, in putting his hand on the head of the animal that is going to die. A life, then, was offered upon the altar. It was to be completely burnt upon the altar. This is uh, the going up part, to, to, to burn, it, burn it up in smoke. 
And depending upon the financial status of the one making the offering, it could be a bull, it could be a lamb or a goat, or it could be a dove or some sort of bird. In, in the Cornerstone Commentary, we read that physical contact with the animal shows that there was no worship by proxy or at a safe distance. The worshiper personally carried out over half of the ritual steps, actually more than the priest did. Um, and so the worshiper got physically involved, touching, holding, bringing, seeing, smelling. He was involved with the animal. So we have the, the burnt offering in chapter 1. Next, in chapter 2, we have the grain offering. Now, if the burnt offering involved the death of an animal, the grain offering, there was no, there was no de death involved uh, because uh, it, it involves flour and oil and incense. This was a celebratory offering. Leviticus 2.1, Now, when anyone presents a grain offering as an offering to the Lord, his offering shall be a fine flour, and he shall pour it, uh, pour on it and put frankincense on it. That is, he's going to make it sweet. Um, notice uh, the, the term there, the minksha, a, a, uh, a tribute, an offering, a gift. But the idea here from the context is that, yes, it is going to be a grain offering. That's not necessarily in the word, uh, but it is um, set forth in the context. The same term, is used in Genesis chapter 4 of both Cain and Abel's offering. That's why I say the word itself doesn't necessarily mean grain offering. The word is a more general word. It can be used of any sort of offering or tribute. But the context here in Leviticus cha uh, chapter 2 is going to let us know this, ki this kind of offering, this kind of tribute, this kind of gift is going to be uh, involving um, uh, that which grows um, that the plant life that grows, grain and things like that, rather than the death of an animal. In the grain offering, um, it, it was an unbloody offering. You can't make you can't make wheat bleed. Uh, it describes the king's tribute. Uh, the king would be would be supplemented. He would receive tributes of food from his subjects, and God is our king, so he is the one who is receiving the king's tribute. It is connected to the idea of hospitality. Uh, remember how Abraham has three visitors show up at his tent. What does he do? He goes to, uh, to make an offering for them. It was to be made without leaven. Um, now, leaven oftentimes uh, represents sin, not always, uh, but leaven always represents influence, some sort of outside influence. Uh, so no leaven, no honey. Uh, because those were outside influences, um, and so that's what they represented. The grain offering part went to the Lord, and the rest went to Aaron and his sons. And so, notice God, uh, part of it is offered to him, and then part is enjoyed by the priests and their sons. It was to be seasoned with salt as a salt covenant. Now, we have a connection to Jesus because he is the bread of life. He has been lifted up as a grain offering for us. Think about this. We, we partake of him. We eat of his body. We drink of his blood. Not literally, but we, when we eat the bread and when we drink the wine, we are communing spiritually with Jesus. So we have the burnt offering, the grain offering. Next, we have the peace offering. Um, this involves rejoicing. It can be a, a male or female uh, animal. Uh, it can be uh, from the cattle, from the sheep. Chapter six, uh, chapter three, and verse one. Now, if his offering is a sacrifice of peace offerings, if he's going to offer it out of the herd, whether male or female, he shall offer it without defect before the Lord. So, uh, notice the, the it is a uh, a zebak uh, uh, shalamim. Uh, of course, you can you can hear that word shalom there, um, an offering of peace, or it's, it's actually plural here, uh, but that's because it's peace offerings. Verse 2, he shall lay his hand on the head of his offering and slay it at the doorway of the tent of meeting, and Aaron's sons, the priest, shall sprinkle the blood around on the altar. So we have a picture here 
of imputation where the animal is killed and then the sons of Aaron, they take the blood and they sprinkle it. They credit it. A, a, a death has taken place and now it is applied to the altar. Uh, it is reckoned to have died upon the altar. This peace offering uh, could be from the herd of the cattle. It could be from the flock of sheep or goats. It could be male or female. And the fat of the animal, as well as the entrails, were to go to the Lord. The flesh went to the priests and to the one making the offering. In other words, everybody gets to eat. It's an offering that all, it, it's an offering where God is invited to dinner and where you get to partake and where the priests partake, everybody partakes of the offering. Everyone ate a portion of this offering, signifying communion with God. Jesus is our shalom. And now when we hear that word shalom, sometimes we think peace, and, and that is a good translation of it, but also it can have the idea of well-being. After all, if you eat a meal with friends, then, then you're at peace with them. Uh, everything is good, and everything about this offering is good. The peace offering was generally accompanied by a libation of wine. So here again, it connects us to, the, to, this, to this meal, this supper, this communion, where we eat a meal in the presence of our Lord. Um, he not only provides the meal, he is the meal, and he partakes with us as we eat of him, as we drink of him, uh, as we uh, act out our faith, because that's what we're doing when we take the Lord's Supper. Uh, we're, we are acting out the idea of faith. Faith is when you, when you take something and believe it, when you bring it into yourself, well, when I put it into my mouth and swallow it, I'm putting it into myself. So I am, I am eating and drinking faith. We've had the burnt offering, the grain offering, the peace offering. Next, we have the sin offering. It can be a, a bull, uh, a goat, uh, either male or female. And now we have a problem. This is because of sin, unintentional sin. The sin offering... Um, notice we, we see if the anointed priest sins, that's verses 1 through 12. If the people sin, verses 13 through 21. If the leader sins, verses 22 through 26. And if one of the common people sins. So everybody is represented in this, in this offering. Verse 4, he shall bring the bull to the doorway of the tent of meeting before the Lord, and he shall lay his hand on the head of the bull and slay the bull before the Lord. Verse 5, then the anointed priest is to take some of the blood of the bull and bring it to the tent of meeting, and the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle some of the blood seven times before the Lord in front of the veil of the sanctuary. Remember, it's the veil that separates the holy place from the holy of holies, from the very presence of God. He's going there, and, and there in front of that veil, you have the altar of incense and some of that blood is going to be sprinkled there. Verse 7, the priest shall also put some of the blood on the horns of the altar of, of fragrant incense, which is before the Lord in the tent of meeting. And all the blood of the bull he shall pull, pour out at the base of the altar of burnt offering, which is at the doorway of the tent of meeting. So, so some is sprinkled uh, inside. Um, the rest of it is poured out outside at the altar. And so each altar is connected with blood, and, and because of the death that has taken place on the outside altar, now the prayers can be heard. And remember, you don't, act, you don't just hear the prayer, you even smell the prayer because it's a sweet odor of incense. Uh, you, you see and smell and hear the prayers that are coming from inside the tabernacle. Verse 11, but the hide of the bull and all its flesh with its head and its legs and its entrails and its refuse, that is, all the rest of the bull, he is to bring out to a clean place outside the camp where the ashes are poured out and burn it on wood with fire where the ashes are poured out, it shall be burned. Notice that emphasis outside the camp. In Hebrews chapter 13, that same emphasis is, is, is picked up 
where the writer says, chapter 13, verse 11, for the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy place by the high priest as an offering for sin are burned outside the camp. That's what we just read. Verse 12, therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood, suffered outside the gate. The, 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 you know, where, where was Golgotha? Where did Jesus die? We don't know exactly. There's lots of theories. But it was outside the gate of the city. It was outside of Jerusalem. Verse 13, so, and here's the application. So let us go out to him outside the camp. Because he was crucified outside the camp, the writer of the Hebrews, and he's writing to, to those Jewish people that are being tempted uh, gee, you know, we came to Jesus, we recognized him as Messiah, and now we're being persecuted. Wouldn't it be easier for us to just stay here in our Judaism, and and uh, we'll we'll sort of think of Jesus once in a while, but let's let's just continue to stay in our Judaism and wait for a future coming Messiah. Uh, no, he says, let us go out to him outside the camp, even even if it means being rejected by your fellow Jews. Notice, bearing his reproach. Next, we have the sin offering. The sin offering, now the first three offerings were offered as acts of worship. This offering is made for the atonement uh, for sin. Uh, the first three offerings are burnt uh, upon the altar in the compound of the tabernacle. We already saw it. This offering is burnt on the bare earth outside the camp. The sin offering teaches us the great cost of sin. This is an expensive offering where the entire animal is is burnt. It's like, well, why can't we eat some of it? No, it's burnt outside the camp. It teaches us that sin can be ignorant or it can be willful. It also teaches us that sin can be both active or passive. I can sin by what I do, but frankly, I can also sin by what I don't do, by the things that I should have done and failed to do. It teaches us that the only solution to sin is the death of an innocent substitute. That is why Jesus came and died in our place. He is our sin offering. So we have the sin offering, but now we have, uh, beginning in chapter 5, verse 14, the guilt offering. Now, now there's a fine line between the, the sin and the guilt offering. Uh, the uh, guilt offering uh, involves a ram or some equivalent animal. Um, this is an atoning offering, uh, very much like the sin offering. The guilt offering, this offering, is the only one not described as a soothing aroma because, <laughs> because the one offering it is guilty. It includes the mandate of a financial recompense to the party that was wronged. So not only do I offer the offering, I also go and make restitution for the wrong that was done. Both sin and guilt offerings are for unintentional offenses. The, the, um, it's, not, it's not a get-out-of-jail-free card. It's not, uh, okay, uh, go ahead and do what you want. Uh, do the wrong. It's okay because then you can all, always go back and offer a sin or a guilt offering. No. It's described as being for unintentional offenses. I didn't, I didn't mean to do that, but I did. Uh, I did that wrong thing. Romans chapter 8, verse 3, For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, so that, the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So you approach God, not on the basis of your goodness, but on the basis of his Son who died for you, and in the Spirit that he has given for you. Revelation chapter 5 and verse 9, I think, alludes to the same thing, where we see this vision uh, of, the, of the angels, the elders, the the uh, living creatures, and they all, they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and, per here it is, and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. We have been purchased by God as his special people. 